Uh, just to show you another one, this is the car to car uh, system. So, so uh, basically, this is uh, the, uh, the the same type of size of, of uh, modules, of course, that we are supplying to the to the industry. Um, Kurt introduced already the three big trends that we see driving the automotive innovations, the automotive industry, and. My most favorite one is the one in the middle. So this uh, aiders towards self-driving. So in other words, how do we convert cars that had been in the past uh, horse carriages that by accident had an engine uh, into self-driving robots or robots that by accident have four wheels? Yeah. And why am I so upbeat on that trend? Well, you see it there in that text below that uh, blue, uh, blue bubble. Every year, 1.3 million people die. Now, nowadays, today, on the world's roads. If I can reduce that figure, then I, as a techie, have done my job in my work life. Yeah? So very personally, that is one of my clear goals. And what is the answer to reducing that figure? Well, you see it here on the slide. It is getting the human out of that equation. Because 95% of all fatal accidents are caused by let's say, performance errors, decision errors, or recognition errors of myself. Recognition error is basically I overlook uh, a child playing at the, um, at, the, at the side of the road. Uh, decision error, uh, OK, I, uh, uh, of course, drive too fast where I, where I uh, potentially should not. Performance errors, very common at the moment. The road fatality rates are going up again because people start texting. If you are doing an SMS while driving, the likelihood that you commit an accident is 40, 40 times higher than if you're normally driving. So in other words, if I could get a robot driving me that has no emotions, is never drunk, is never texting, is never caring for the nagging kids in the back seat, then basically my life gets way better in 80, 95% of the driving cases. And this is, of course, what we're trying to do. So, super easy, how do we do that? Well, the industry is at the moment going over various steps and you can see two trends, two religions uh, in the automotive uh, industry. The existing car makers basically are of course driving from the left over these levels, level one, level two, level three, into more and more advanced levels of assisted driving. There is companies like the ones in Mountain View who are jumping directly to this level four and say, hey, come on, we are in robotics. How do we make sure that these robots uh, are, are uh, well, well driving on roads? So Google is, for example, in that level four. So what we are saying is basically the technology that we have here, our complete portfolio from A to Z, NXP is the only company in that industry that can provide all electronics for self-driving robots. We have the sensing part. We have, of course, these levels of assistance systems. I'm going to talk you uh, through that in a, in a second. And what we're going to announce today is we have also the brains for making the driving decision. Super easy. Take a few compute chips. A lot of people in the industry do that for robots. Consumer grade, you can get it off the shelf. Put a few nice algorithms on it and you're done. This is not how automotive industry works. What I call here the robustness tetrahedron is basically what we use for, for uh, capturing value, for generating value, and what is basically our DNA as NXP Automotive, um, because this is exactly what we try to master. Device reliability, we all can understand. So basically, uh, uh, each component should be as robust as possible to, uh, to make sure that if you have 100,000 components in a car, uh, not, uh, not uh, uh, every half an hour the car is, is breaking down with a failure. So this device reliability, I think the automotive industry has, has mastered over the last 25, um, uh, 30 years. But then, of course, what I just said uh, already, road safety, I try to get the human factor out of the equation. But we are seeing two new approaches in the industry. And the one is what most of you, I guess, know is the functional safety. So this famous ISO 26262 robustness ACIL classifications. How do we make sure that in case the car has a failure, this failure does not lead to a fatality? And I give you one example. Just imagine the power steering is failing on a car. Is this now a thing that can lead to a hazard or not? The answer it, it, it is it depends. On a Fiat 500, very likely this is not a thing that can lead to a fatality. On a Ford F350, with a 45 kilo lady driving that truck, 
that evaluation might be very, very different if the power steering fails. So it depends on the overall system, how we look at that. And of course, this all boils down to us as component suppliers then uh, in the, in the uh, uh, last resort. And the same we are seeing now with functional security, as I have called it, because also what happens if the car is going to be hacked? What happens if a hacker introduces a cert, uh, introdu uh, intrudes into a certain part of the car? Well, in the infotainment branch, sort of okay, yeah. In the engine management and braking uh, domain, uh, maybe not that funny, yeah. And this is what Kurt said prior. We have solutions for all of that. We are partnering very much with the ecosystem. We are inviting tier ones and OEMs to play with our solutions and to help us all master this ecosystem. Well, and what is that? If you're looking at how is a self-driving robot built up, you have in all cases a sensing department. That is what, what Kurt uh, just talked about. So these various sensors that we have, and by the way, you see there these, these orange rims around the, the boxes. This is where NXP has a leadership position and where we have a strong offering in our portfolio. So on car to car radar, uh, we heard about, but also processors for cameras and laser signal processing we have uh, in the portfolio for ultrasonics. And also we have the sensors for, let's say, uh, determining the, the uh, condition of the car in terms of wheel speed and motion uh, of, um, of the vehicle. And then on the very right side, we have, of course, the signals that we are sending to the arms and legs of the car. We are the number one position in that network, so basically the interfaces that are glued to the wiring harness. And the magic is that blue box in the middle because that is the brain of that whole thing. And how does that brain look like? Well, you've heard a lot in the, in the press, and, and uh, I guess you are, you're very familiar with that. There is large discussions on neural networks, uh, devices that are deep learning, uh, systems that are uh, even better than the human brain. But that's only doing half of the story of that self-driving robot capabilities that we need to have in place. One example, it does not help me that my car has the same recognition capabilities like I have, because it is totally unimportant for that car, I hope at least, whether Cameron Diaz is crossing this, the, the street in front of that car or Lars Riga, so uh, the beautiful girl and the old and ugly guy. Yeah? So the car should not make any decisions uh, dependent on that. It is also completely unimportant whether there is an old Toyota or, or a brand new Porsche approaching me. But what that car needs to do is it needs to 150% reliable classify and detect objects, pedestrian, toy, truck, car, or bicycle. Because then the car needs to predict what is the next likely traffic pattern that I'm going to see from a, from a truck or from a pedestrian. That is the important part. So deep learning is needed, but is not doing the entire job. What we need is we need to have in the end for serious production a highly reliable and also deterministic, and I'll tell you why in a second, deterministic system that is doing that object detection, object classification, and then the estimation on, on how objects are, are moving. Why do we want to have a deterministic system in the end? Well, very simple. If you are a car maker and you are in court and you have to explain why your block of steel went left and caused an accident uh, in, in, in case of staying stay in course or, or, or moving right, then the last thing that you want to wanna, wanna explain to a judge is a neural network because uh, you have coefficients and this thing is not deterministic. So just to demystify that whole story a bit, we need to be crystal clear for having neural networks being trained to having good recognition and then out of that, the, the logics uh, behind it, that needs to be deterministic and crystal clear and ultra robust. Summer as winter, fog as rain, as, as bright sunlight. So for that, what is the best technical setup? Well, in my opinion, it is not single machines that consume 300 watts and are water cooled, but it is systems that are very energy efficient. So for example, our blue box, uh, you will see in a, in a second, is a, is a 40 watts machine. With that power budget, I can even have redundancy. Three or four of those systems next to each other, uh, supervising each other for functional safety, helping each other out, and being at a fraction of the power budget of, of uh, some of the other solutions in the market. So basically, that blue box is really a blue box development platform that we have uh, also down there in the, in the tech labs. Uh, you, can, you can see it. 
And this is, of course, the open invitation for the universities, tier ones, and OEMs of this world to help us putting the right algorithms together and to try to move self-driving robots as far as possible. And what we are claiming is basically, we are very sure that we can do autonomous driving up to the SAE level four, which basically means under restricted conditions, so for example, motorways, we are absolutely sure that our system is doing the self-driving. At the moment, no one, literally no one, has proven that this self-driving works under all conditions. So narrow streets uh, in, in downtown Heidelberg or whatsoever, uh, crazy traffic patterns, strollers on the road, uh, uh, joggers, uh, cars, and so on. There, we all as an industry still need to prove where we can go. I'm pretty convinced that uh, th these type of, of setups and these type of systems can do the job there, but that will be, of course, a joint effort in the next years, next five to 10 years, possibly, to come. But what we for sure will see is, based on similar solutions, or hopefully the NXP solution, we will see motorway assist level four type, or completely autonomous driving systems on the road in the, in the coming years. And what is it basically that is so special uh, in, the, in that blue box uh, system that we have? Well, we are using industry ready components. So in principle, if someone has an ADAS system as of today, he can take our silicon, uh, put it on a PCB, uh, take the right code on uh, and, uh, and have an ADAS system or even a an, an highly automated uh, driving system. Our silicon is shipping already in mass volumes. So basically the, the uh, device robustness uh, should not be an issue anymore that is, uh, that is proven. We have enough interfaces on these development platforms uh, to basically offer all sorts of sensor inputs uh, where the universities tier ones uh, can really play with, with the different configurations of sensor systems, which is important because all the mass volume car makers, they do not only have one flagship product that is autonomously driving, but they also want to have the, uh, the smaller cars, the cheaper cars, at least running on a certain level of ADAS systems, if not fully autom uh, automated. And what of course we need is, we need to have an easy to use system for the developers. So the barriers for the coding, for the operating systems and so on, should be pretty low. And already in the last two days, I was talking to a lot of the operating system and tool chain vendors here that came then and said, okay, Lars, can you explain more on the technology? Because what we want to do now is, we want to put our operating systems onto that platform and we need to understand how we optimally use your security hooks of the blue box to making sure that the hardware security is optimally leveraged also for our operating systems and our tool chains. So basically that ecosystem started in the last two days already rapidly moving and then the, yeah, my hopes are of course uh, very high that we, that we can accelerate there further. Yeah. And it is not that a few uh, crazy goose here at NXP have dreamt up that box and, and, and uh, we claim now that this is a, a great idea. No, we have of course uh, started dialogues already uh, yeah, on the Freescale side, I think nine months to one year ago, with our lead customers have asked, hey, what do you think? Is this a sane story? Does this make sense for, uh, to all uh, of you? And, and should we go ahead with that, uh, with that offering? Answer was yes. And uh, some of the, of the big tier ones and, and car OEMs are looking already for more than, than half a year into those solutions. Yeah, so uh, it, is, it is not uh, an, an idea that we had in isolation, of course. So just to capture a bit on a, on a one slider, the capabilities of that blue box. So basically what you have is you have two core components in that device. So the one is a, an S32V, which is basically a vision controller system that we are using here uh, for the, for the uh, uh, car connectivity, of course, so this one has all the interfaces, FlexRay, uh, Ethernet, uh, and the like, to the car network, is running the Autosar uh, domains and, and all of that, uh, is basically the watchdog also for the functional safety of the entire system, and is basically um, uh, good in, in image pre-processing. And the other thing uh, is a processor that we have stolen inside the company from our digital networking colleagues. And basically, this is a device that was designed initially for server farms. So for all these cloud computing farms. Uh, and with that, of course, it's a compute monster. Yeah, 90,000 DMIPS, uh, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big device. But the architecture is pretty sexy for automotive, I have to say. So it's an eight-core device. 
And with these eight cores, of course, you get immediately a certain level of functional safety, at least, uh, for free. Because these cores can supervise each other and say, hey, are you still working? Give me your checksum. Are you still working? Are you still working? And they are, they, are, they are checking each other. We have a sort of separation of concerns in that device. Together, of course, that's a, that's a great combination. Then uh, what you see is, uh, I said it prior already, we have the open, uh, uh, open platforms software-wise, so uh, bring your own code uh, and, and develop uh, or use one of our preferred uh, software partners there. Uh, but what is uh, even more important uh, in, the, in the bottom left corner there is we have the ARM Trust Zone and the CSE secure elements in that blue box already. So we get for free. Uh, of course, uh, already there, the, the, the good link to how is state-of-the-art data security combined with functional safety. And that is, uh, I think, what we, what we can search in the industry um, uh, with, the, with the competition, of course, because this year at the moment is that combination that we need for, for managing this robustness tetrahedron. Yeah. So, just very quickly, very complicated techie picture. I cannot go without at least one techie picture here. Um, how, how is that uh, device set up? You see here on the top part, this is this Layerscape processor from the cloud computing. Uh, this is basically, you see there on the, on the right, if you, if you have a closer look, uh, these, these eight uh, big uh, ARM cores uh, that are running with a lot of peripherals. And, and uh, basically, this is uh, our number cruncher in the, um, uh, in, the, in the blue box. And then you have in the bottom part here, the schematics drawing uh, for the ones of you who want to have a closer look, including also the, the car interfaces. And of course, uh, basically a bit of the, the, the split of the tasks, how we foresee it on that system. So basically, the sensor actuator management, so talking to the arms and legs of the car uh, and doing the, um, doing the fusion part uh, of whatever in terms of sensor data uh, comes in, and then the functional safety surveillance and checks of the system. Yeah. With that, I'm at the end of the Blue Box intro, and that will be the beginning of the Q&A session uh, with Matt, Kurt, and myself. So thanks a lot for the attention, and uh, yeah. Kurt, I was faster than you with finishing my, my part of the lunch, so I can stay here now. <laughs>